Um, this is not, I'm going to talk about something I just was impressed with in, um, in worship. Um, but this ain't what I'm actually going to uh, minister on today. We're going to get into, um, we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit and really get into some things. I've been questioned, you know, um, you know, what my belief is and, you know, do I believe in the Holy Spirit um, or the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Um, and the question is, yes, I do. But I want to... I'm going to begin to really open it up to you guys and show you some stuff. And um, by the time it's over with, it, it might go in, probably go into next week for sure. You're really going to have an understanding of what the Holy Spirit, who the Holy Spirit is, what He is, what He's come to do through Scripture, not through any uh, one man's interpretation as far as what they think or what they believe or what they feel, or we're going to have a true understanding of who the Spirit is, what He's come to do, and um, because without Him, I mean, we, you know, we can't do anything. Um, man, doing praise and worship, I was impressed with something, um, and it was, um, man, when God calls you to do something, you know, um, during worship, Jason had said something. You know, I will stand. You know, um, Peter was called out of the boat, you know, in the midst of the storm. I want to share something with you. Um, that the things that we're going through right now, it's only preparation for something that's coming. So, things that you and I experience right now in our life, though you don't understand it, um, especially when you're called out and you say you want to be used by God, you know, we have this uh, preconception that being used by God is actually to, you know, God's going to use me to minister, or He's going to use me on a praise and worship team, or He's going to, you know, I'm going to be a big time evangelist and travel the world, and I'm going to be the new greatest, you know, hit band, praise and worship team, or, you know, and man, that has so far missed it. That is the yeah. that is the American conception yes. of what it is to be called out and used by God. Um, and I tell you what, you can only learn these things by actually going through it and really realizing. I remember when the Lord started downloading things on me, and I was like, man, one day I'm going to be traveling the world, and I'm going to be in a plane, and people's going to know me around the world, and. Because of the, some of the revelations that God has given me and stuff like that, and but um, boy, did I miss it, you know. And um, that isn't that isn't anywhere, you know. Uh, I guess God's mentality of thinking, you know, um, it, it, it's what we see and what we think of as success. Whether we're numbering the size of the church. You know, um, to you know the size of the building, to what's collected in the offering box, to you know um, how many doctors and attorneys and lawyers do you have coming to your church? I've heard that before, and um, you know where I've I've already been. You know, in the midst of talking about, listen, if you're going to set up a church, make sure you set up a church. You know, go build a church in Mandeville because that's where the money's at. I mean, that's what it was told to me, you know. And, um, and I remember when the Lord called me to pastor, you know, I was thinking he was going to call me back to Chalmette. And, um, and I, I thought he was sending me to Columbia at one time, and it wasn't there. And I thought he was calling me back to Chalmette because I seen things that was happening there, and it wasn't there. And, and, um, and then I was looking at a place in Picayune, and... Um, it wasn't there, and the only other place that I'd heard was Poplarville, and, and I remember the Lord said, you know, um, I said, I ain't going to Poplarville. There ain't nothing in Poplarville, Lord. And he said, yes, there is. You are. Yeah. You know, so, you know, we're talking about a population of probably 3,000 in the poorest state in all of the states, but, you know, thank you, Jesus, Mississippi is the most benevolent. Yes. Um, when God calls you into an area to start something or to do something, what I've uh, recognizing what the Lord was speaking to me, um, 
is that this was already, you know, he had to take me through some things before actually this can come about. And one of the things was, this was probably, um, this was now eight years ago, um, you know, I actually started building a church in Picayune, literally, physically, hand, you know, building a a church that was going to seat 5,000. And um, I was over the whole building committee of it, and um, I actually left a general contractor that I was working for um, to go do this for the church that I was going to prior. And, um, and I told him, I said, listen, you just pick out the general contract that you want, and I'll leave what I'm doing to go build a church. And I was like, you know, this is it, Lord. I'm going, you know, I'm going to build this big church, and then I'm going to be in full-time ministry. And, um, you know, and then come to find out, you know, the, ma- the man that I was actually working for, I heard he was a pastor for 10 years, and um, I'm like, man, I am set, you know. And we had some unbelievable conversations in the beginning. And, and um, you know, and my job was to uh, actually put me over five jobs in the area. And, um, but in the process of all this going on, I had to dig out a big foundation and bring in some fill so I can start actually building the church. And in the process, started building another church. You know, um, most of you guys might know it, um, the manor building. Um, my brother and I and my son actually physically laid the foundation and built the building, you know, with our own hands, erected all the steel. And But in the process of all of that going on, you know, um, you don't really understand what you're actually doing, you know, until you really start coming under friendly fire. And, you know, what you thought was somebody that you was working for, um, you know, God wants you to use them, wants, wants to use you to speak into their life. But, you know, through whatever it is, through God or through the enemy, there's all kind of things that was raised up between us that in the process of me trying to build a building, you know, you know he's trying to run me off. You know, and it was a whole year of um, having to deal with him trying to run me off and run my brother off and my son and, you know, trying to just, you know, tear us apart. But the whole deal was the Lord wouldn't let me quit, you know, and I could have went back to another job. And while I was in service just now, you know, the Lord was telling me that, you know, I began working with you on laying a foundation and building a building eight years ago and you know one thing I said was that I would never quit and I wound up um, building the the manor building I wound up uh, building a new dialysis clinic I was over five schools the same time I was running five schools building a dialysis clinic building the manor building digging out the foundation for uh, the new uh, 5,000 square foot church and um, and doing some miscellaneous other things with uh, me and four other people, and he was trying to get me to quit. And um, but the Lord said no because he wanted to use me, you know, to speak into his life. And when um, this individual, like God, wants to talk to, when you're called, you know, you saying, "Lord, use me," your Lord, use me, you know, to further your kingdom. You know, um, it, it's, it is, uh, it'll definitely, he'll test you, he'll try you um, to see if you're going to quit or you're going to endure and go on. And, um, and then in the midst of everything that you're going on, then God gives you a word that you've got to go tell the man that wants to follow you that he has lost his hearing. And, you know, God is trying to speak to him. And, and, but all of that right there, you know, in fact, after I worked with him one solid year and finished the building, my next job was to build the St. Joseph's Catholic Church right here on Highway 11. That was my next job. In fact, I was sent up there to go get the blueprints to start building a church right here in Poplarville, you know, which was eight years ago. And, um, and then needless to say, when I went up there, they just said, you know, basically, you know, um, God did his work. You know, um, I didn't quit. I finished the work that he had given me and also spoke the words to the man that, you know, he wanted me to speak to. 
and uh, a couple of times. Um, but man, when God calls you out to do something, He's already, you know, um, most of the time it's not nothing what, you, what it it seems um, to look like. You know, I can even look at Pete. Pete, did you ever think you'd be playing music in the church? No, no because God, and playing worship music at that. And and Pete is someone who played, you know, in the bars and did all kind of things. And and now he's, you know, I will trust, you know, playing these. And I'm so thankful that God has brought him here, you know, because he adds so much to what's going on. Sometimes, you know, we get this perception of what like. You know, the new, um, uh, we're about to start teaching over at the college and we're calling it, you know, this is not your ordinary Bible study. You know, this is not your ordinary church. And uh, I don't think the churches that we look at today, the big buildings and all that kind of stuff we see, and the people dressed up in fancy suits and all that, and I'm not coming against the fancy suits and stuff, but, you know, I just didn't see that in biblical times. I saw the Pharisees and Sadducees like that, that, you know, built big things and all that kind of stuff, and I'm not pointing the finger at anybody in no means. But I don't believe the church in America is going to stay like that much longer. I believe it's all going to come down and it's going to be taken down to what we're looking at today. A family, a group, a church in a house, a church in a little place. And, and um, it's, you know, like the church in China. You know, they're underground and, and um, all over the place. They're, um, I just heard uh, this morning that um, not only are they beheading Christians, you know, um, you know, overseas, but also they're beheading the babies of Christians. And, um, you know, the reality is that the world we're living in today, you know, um, the enemy wants us dead, you know, because we're a threat to him. And um, they're not worried about anybody else, you know, but, you know, the Christians. And, um, and of course, the Jewish people, you know, our brothers and sisters through whom, you know, the word has came. But um, sometimes, you know, I wrote down, you know, it's hard building a church right here in Poplarville, you know, uh, coming under the friendly fire that I've come on. You know, my biggest, some of the biggest things that I've had to face right here comes from Christian people, yeah. you know. And, um, and you know, um, one of the problems that's going on right now in warfare, they can't, they don't know who the enemy is. It ain't like in the old days where, you know, they was dressed out and, you know, in these fatigues, and that was dressed out in that, those fatigues, and that was the enemy. You knew who the enemy was, whether, whatever side you was on. Well, these days, you don't know who the enemy is. And it, you come under friendly fire, and it could be the person sitting right next to you that will actually betray you. You know, in fact, the Bible says in the last days, you know, the members of your own family will turn you in, will betray you. And um, it's... Uh, so... It was just something that the Lord had put on my heart, you know, um, and, um, and I'm going to lead that into where I believe all of this began, why we have such, you know, uh, why the church is a split as a whole. And, um, but I just wanted to make you aware, when God calls you to do something, you know, number one, you have to follow Him. You know, by, the Bible says that He's called us to go ye therefore into all the world and make disciples. You know, a disciple is a follower of a teacher. That's, and we're all, our teacher is Jesus. That's who we follow. We follow His Word. We follow His teachings. All the way to, like, you know, when the sons of thunder, James and John, their mother came to Jesus and said, you know, could you grant my sons to sit at your right and your left? And Jesus said, are, you able, are they able to partake in the cup in which I'm going to drink of? Which is the cup of affliction, the cup of suffering. He was going to die. And, you know, they said, you know, you know, quickly, you know, we will, we are, we are. We can t partake in that cup. And sure enough, you know, they did. And it's a cup of suffering, it's a cup of to die. And they didn't know what cup he was talking about. And then Jesus said, only my Father can grant whether, you know. In fact, their names are called the sons of thunder. The word thunder actually translates into the sons of quarrel. They were always quarreling, fighting about who was greater in the kingdom. I mean, after three and a half years of being with Jesus on the night of Passover, that's their last thoughts. 
who's going to be greatest in the kingdom, so that Jesus had to go and grab the washing, the foot washing bowl, and gird himself and wash their feet and show them, this is who's going to be the greatest. After three and a half years of being with Jesus himself, the great teacher, them watching him, their last thoughts before he dies is, who's going to be greater in the kingdom? Boy, is that not man? That's that's man's... You know, man, I wonder if I can have a big church or I wonder if I can do these great and mighty things. And, well, you know, the great and mighty things might be, you know, wherever God calls you. And it ain't, you know, I'm going to tell you, the great and mighty things is definitely not on this platform right here. It's not on this altar. It's not in the biggest church, successful church that you can actually, you know, it's going to be somewhere, you know, um, somebody you don't know. Somebody that um, is on their knees praying somewhere. Somebody who's serving somebody. Um, somebody that we would never esteem the greatest in God's kingdom. I can guarantee it. And it's none that's on TV. You know, it's none that has the biggest churches. In fact, it's the ones we don't even know that's going to be greater in the kingdom when we get up there. In fact, when we get up there, we're going to be like, man, who are you? You know? You know? And, that's right. And, um, and Jesus is going to let us know who they were. So um, I just wanted to share that with you. That um, when God calls you to do His work, man, it's serving your neighbor. You know, loving your neighbor as yourself. You know, I learned a lesson in that. You know, um, should I even charge my neighbor or anybody, you know, for goat milk? Love them as yourself. Do I charge myself for it? You know, it's kind of a... Uh, do we really love them? Do we love our neighbor as ourself? Jesus said the greatest commandment is love the Lord thy God with all your heart, mind, soul, body, and strength. And as one that is no less than that, love your neighbor as yourself. Which is wow. I mean, I haven't, atta- I haven't attained that. I can definitely tell you that. I haven't attained that. I need it, you know. And I say I, I love them and stuff like that. And, um, but... And the whole law hinges on these two. So when you've attained and loving your neighbor as yourself, you know, whoo, that means you're looking out for your neighbor's good better than your own. And they said, who is your neighbor? Well, it's you. You're my neighbor. You're the closest ones to me. It's not only physically, it's spiritually as well. So my job is to love you and to see to your success, to make sure you are equipped and ready, and whatever it is that, you know, however I can help you. And I know it's hard in the times and that we live in and, and all of that, but if we want to break the Scriptures down and look at them, wow, do we really love our neighbor as ourself? That's a, that's a big one. But anyway, let's, uh, Father, in Jesus' name, um, we're not perfect, Father. You are perfect. And we are on our way to perfection. And we know that we will be like you when you come. So, Father, I thank you, Lord. That's why we don't look at man. We don't look at women. We don't look at anyone but you, Father. Because you're the only one that has attained perfection, Lord. And uh, we are in a sinful body. But, Lord, we practice righteousness because you are holy. And you are righteous. Father, I ask that your spirit would lead us and guide us today, Father, so that we'll know the truth of the gospel. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would reveal yourself to us today um, and to clearly let us know and understand the work and the power and the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, in the believer's life. Um, I thank you for the gift that you have given us, Lord, um, your spirit. Um, who leads us and guides us into all truth, which is Jesus Christ. We thank you for it. We thank you for the perfect gift, the Lamb. We thank you for the gifts that come with the gift of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the gift giver. We thank you for the gifts that come with Him, the non-gifts of the Spirit and the non-fruits of the Spirit. We thank you for the gifts that you've given to the church so that we can become mature and... um, and complete uh, till we all come in unity in the body of Christ. And I just ask that you would reveal yourself to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen and amen. All right. Um, 
this is definitely going to be a... Uh, um, it's going to take me a couple of weeks to do this, but um, I want to take my time and, and just kind of um, show you guys some stuff. Um, I put some questions up there on a the board um, to some things that are regularly um, asked about the Holy Spirit. Excuse me, I'm going to get some water. Um, you know, uh, some of the questions, who is the Holy Spirit? And... You know, how can we really find out who the Holy Spirit is? And how can we better understand the Holy Spirit? Uh, what is the job uh, and the purpose of the Holy Spirit in our life? Um, one of, uh, what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit? You know, people, um, and is it for everyone? I was just asked that. Um, I was, last week I was messing around with Joe and Madge, and we had a little meeting two Mondays ago. Well, little did I know that somebody was actually in the storehouse when I was actually questioning Joe about some things that was at another church when I had went and ministered the prior week. And because of what I was talking to Joe and the, uh, the people at the, um, the table about the Holy Spirit, I was kind of questioning them, you know, with some things. And um, they thought I didn't believe in the, in, in the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit or the baptism of the Holy Spirit because they only caught part of the conversation, you know. And uh, so when I went and ministered at this church, before I left, they had hemmed me up, you know, and they was like, do you believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And Because we heard you speaking and we are not really sure if you believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit or not. And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. And um, so I had to explain myself. So that's only catching part of the, you know, the passage of what was being say, said. And, um, and I was messing with Joe pretty hard. I was. <laughs> and, uh, in fact, I even talked to Charlene afterwards about it. Charlene said you was leaning on him hard. <laughs> but, um, you know, my intentions is to, not everybody is a teacher. You know, um, and I was like, uh, you know, putting him in a corner. And trying to back him up, you know, to see what was going to come out, you know. And uh, he did good, though. He did really good. Why do some believe? Why do some believe that you must speak in tongues to be saved? There's a bunch of other questions, um, you know, because uh, we're going to get into some of these questions right here. But the only way that you can truly understand the Holy Spirit, the only possible way, is you have to go back to the old covenant. You will not understand the Spirit. Actually, in the Old Testament, it's not an Old Testament, it's an Old Covenant. Um, we're under a new covenant, the covenant of Christ, the blood, where the Old Covenant covered sins. The New Covenant washes them away. There's no more remembrance of that sin, which is amazing. Where the Old Covenant, there was a, a rehearsal of the sins that was committed over and over, and there had to be a continual shedding of blood, with the new covenant, once we uh, accept Jesus, Yeshua, as our personal Savior, it says that, you know, there is a washing away, you know, uh, and it, the Bible says that your sins are cast in the deepest part of the sea where no man can drag them up, and um, so, which is a good thing. So we don't, when you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, and uh, you repent, and you've been uh, immersed with Him in baptism, in the death, burial, and resurrection, it says that He washes your sin away, and you become a new creation, a new creature, a new babe. You've been born again. So anything that you've actually done up until that time of that new birth process, no matter what it was, whether you murdered somebody, killed somebody, um, committed adultery, fornication, you know, homosexuality, lying, cheating, stealing... You know, listen, it says that, you know, Christ forgave all sin, all sin, um, except the blaspheming of the Holy Ghost. And if you don't know what that is, you probably haven't done it, so you don't have to worry about it. But in case you want to know, that's calling the work of the Spirit the work of Satan. That's the blaspheming of the Holy Spirit. So, um, and that's why you got to be really careful, um, you know, uh, you know, and I don't want to say judging, but testing the spirits to see if they are of God or not. I kind of stand away from some things unless, you know, I can actually 
point it out and say that is definitely not of God, you know. And then, you know, I just pray over it and say, Lord, you know, this is you. Um, I want to talk to you about the Holy Spirit today. The Holy Spirit in the Hebrew, um, he is actually called, he's not called the Holy Spirit, but just as we see him in the New Testament, or the Barit HaDashah, the New Covenant, that's what Barit HaDashah means, a New Covenant, we see in the Old Covenant the working of the Holy Spirit, or if you want to call him the Holy Ghost, um, or the third person of the Trinity, the Triune God. Um, he's uh, the active force of God the Father. He is the breath of God. He is the life of God. Um, uh, but the only way we can really understand them in the Old Covenant, you don't see the Holy Spirit mentioned as much as you do in the New Covenant, where it's out, you know, outright spoken. Have you received, you know, the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost? You know, um, in the Old Covenant, he's kind of uh, concealed, just like Jesus is, and I'll tell you how. Um, in, the, in the Old Covenant, he's referenced some 81 times in the Old Covenant, the Holy Spirit. Um, he's actually referenced more than that, but um, some 81 times he's referenced in the Holy Spirit as the wind. Um, it's actually the word ruach which means the breath of God. So if we're going to go back and we're going to see who the Spirit of God is, um, we're going to go back into the Old Covenant, and this is what we see in the beginning. It says we see the active port, the active um, breath or the wind of God being manifested. Um, and this is why it's important to understand in Acts chapter 2 it says, and there came the sound of a rushing mighty wind. Right? That was the evidence that the Spirit had come. They understood that the breath of God, the Spirit of God, was in the wind. The wind. Okay? It wasn't the tongues that were manifested. And I'm going to explain that to you in a minute. And there came the sound as a rushing mighty wind that filled the whole house. And as the Spirit gave them utterance, they began to speak in, you know... Um, they began to speak in tongues. They be, be, began to speak in another language. And we're going to explore that and see what's happening. Because if you don't understand the Old Covenant, then you won't understand why did He show up as a Russian mighty wind? Why did the Holy Spirit, you know, uh, why did the Spirit descend upon Jesus' head like as into a dove, like a dove? Why did the Holy Spirit have, why did He, was a, why was it a representation as fire sitting on top of the people's head? So we got the Russian mighty wind, we got like a dove, we got like fire. What is all of these things? It was all evidence that the Holy Spirit had come and manifested itself. We see the Holy Spirit in the Old Covenant didn't live in anyone. You know, up until, you know, in the beginning he lived in Adam until the fall. And then after that, you know, um, you know uh, he lost the, the breath of life. And Adam began to die. And in the Old Covenant, the Spirit of the Lord would only come upon men. And they would begin like Saul. You know, it came upon 70 of them and they began to prophesy. The Holy Spirit came upon Saul and he began to prophesy. Prophesy means to preach. That's what it means. They began to preach the things of God. Should we go over that? Remember when they was in the camp? There was some that was outside the camp and two was in the camp. Should we go over there and forbade them and tell them stop? No. Don't stop them, because the Spirit had descended on them, and they began to speak with new tongues. They began to speak another language, and that's some of the things we don't understand. But we go all the way back to the very beginning, Genesis. We see the first where God begins to move, and it's in uh, Genesis chapter 1. Go to Genesis chapter 1. Because I tell you what, um, there is... Um, Am I going to step on your toes? Yes, I am. That's okay. I'm going to step on your toes. I'm going to tell you things that, you know, you're going to be like, well, I don't believe that way. You know, I don't, I don't see it that way. Most of the ones that's actually going to, um, that's going to say that, 
is going to be um, a lot of you have been taught a certain way. So when you hear it, you conceive the Holy Spirit a certain way. Um, it's just the way you've been taught, not the way that you have studied and read. And you're going to find out when you go back and you begin to study and begin to read, it's really going to open some things up to you. You're going to be like, wow, you might have to tear out some things that are built on your foundation that is, you know, wood, hay, and stubble, and it won't pass through the fire. And the fire of God, we know that the Bible says that the Word of God is, is like a consuming fire. So it's got to pass and stand. Whatever you've built on that foundation, on Jesus, has got to be able to withstand the fire. And the fire, and Jeremiah says, is the Word of God. Is not the Word of God like a fire and like a hammer. So if what you believe stands the test... Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Their faith was put through literally the fire. Your faith might be tried with fire. Literal. And it will be in the end, spiritually. To see what you was walking in. Was it truth or was it not? So if we go to Genesis chapter 1, it says, um, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. This is just a format of what God had did. And he says, And the earth was without form, and it was void. It was empty. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved. That word right there is hovered, but moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. So before light could be manifested, the Spirit of God had to move, right? It's pretty amazing because this is the same word here that when Moses, uh, um, when God said, you know, told Moses to... Uh, to part the, the Red Sea, the Gulf of Agaba, it says a strong east wind blew all night and separated the waters from the waters and dry land appeared. Wow. That was, and it, says, it, and it says, and a strong east wind, a strong ruach, the ruach, the strong breath of God blew all night and parted the waters from the waters and dry land appeared. This is the same active force that happened in the time of Moses that happened in Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2. Identical. Same thing. He separated the waters from the waters. In fact, where he separated, the waters were standing a thousand foot high. That's how deep it was in the Gulf of Agaba that the, uh, this you know, land bridge this, that goes underneath the sea from one side to the other. He parted it a thousand. That's how deep it was. So you had two walls of water on either side of you a thousand foot high when they went through it. Pretty amazing. That east wind, actually, it says, is called the Ruach, which is the breath of God. And it says in Psalms 1 verse 4, and it says, From the blast of the breath of his nostrils, he parted the sea. That's his breath. So the active force of anything happening in anybody's life, before you or me can receive um, the light of the world, which is Jesus Christ. The sun was created on the fourth day, the, SO, the S-U-N. Jesus came on the fourth day of creation, the S-O-N, and said, I am the light of the world. And before anybody can receive the S-O-N, we have to have an active work of the Holy Spirit hovering over somebody's waters. Yes. 70% land. I mean, 70% water we're made up and 30% land. The earth is made up of 70% water and 30% land. So the birth of the earth, it can be compared to the birth of a newborn believer. And where the spirit doesn't move, you cannot receive the light. You understand? So when you pray for someone, pray that the Spirit of God would move over them like we're praying right now, that God would move over the, over the waters of the college over there, over their land, and do a separation, do a preparation so that those that are over there can receive the light. So if we're going to understand the work of the Spirit, He is an active force in creation. He is an active force in the new birth process. And that's why the birth of the earth can be compared to the birth of a newborn believer. Because Jesus said in John chapter uh, 2, you know, um, when he was talking to Nicodemus, you know, how can I be born again? The wind bloweth where it wants, where it listereth. Hmm. Right? The wind bloweth. What is that word wind right there? Ruach. 
The Spirit of God moves wherever it wants, but you can't see it. So is the Spirit of God. Unless a man is born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. Right? Yes. And in John chapter 3, I'm sorry, it was in John 3. When he's describing the Holy Spirit, Jesus describes the first time we see it in John. He describes him as what? A wind. Wow. The second time the Holy Spirit is spoken of in, in the New Covenant, in the Brit Hadashah, is in Acts, 2, chap, in, in Acts chapter 2, verse 2. He says, And there came a sound as a rushing mighty wind. So how do we understand what he is interpreting? But it's only mentioned as a wind two times in the New Covenant. That's it. All the other times, he is the Holy Spirit. His name comes forth. Just like in the Old Covenant, He is concealed, and you don't really know, He's concealed and hidden in the wind. Just like Jesus is hidden in the Old Covenant. Right? Amen. But once you start digging for Him, you begin to see, wow, it's all about Jesus. And then when you really start digging, you find out, wow, it's the Holy Spirit's active work and all of what's going on that points to Christ. So if we go back to... Um, Genesis 1, 1, 1. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form, and it was void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. In fact, and the Spirit of God moved upon the waters, and God said, let there be light. Remember? In the birth of the earth, even if you look, you see the light come in, and then after you see the light, and he, it says, and He caused the earth to bring forth a tree yielding seed within itself. See, the active work of the Spirit and what's going on, He's part of creation. It's no different than you and me. That He calls us trees and the seed of God is the Word within us and we're to bring forth fruit. So the birth of the earth is identical to the birth of a newborn believer. I mean, they're one and the same and that's what God tries to you know, show us. In fact, on the sixth day He says, you know, and God formed a man and He rested. Um, if we go a little bit further, you know, um, with the Spirit of God, um, and I'll probably miss some. I'm not going to hit them all, but I'm going to talk about a few. Um, if you go to, um, and let me just, I'm going to write this up here so you'll have it. Um, and we'll get back to these questions up here. Um, the Holy Spirit in the Strong's Concordance, in your Hebrew Strong's Concordance, I want you guys to have this. Um, he's mentioned. The Spirit is mentioned some 81 times, you know, as the wind. And you can, you can, you know, get a, a Hebrew Strong's Concordance and um, a Hebrew Strong's exhaust, Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible and just look up wind. And every place you see wind... Um, 81 times it's mentioned as the uh, Ruach. I think that's right. Did I spell that right? I think I did. No, are you... Uh, it's actually like that. It's Ra. Um, it's also Ruach. But it's mentioned some uh, 81 times. And um, it, as the wind, the wind actually translates into Ruach. And um, it's the Hebrew Strong's number, um, 7307. So, 81 times in the New Covenant, I mean in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, not an Old Testament. 81 times, when you look in the Hebrew Strong's Concordance, 81 times the wind is referenced as Ruach, which means um, the breath or the Spirit. <laughs> Of God. So, 81 times in the Old Covenant, He's concealed. So, you can go look in the Hebrew Strongs to 7307, pull out the 81 scriptures, 81 scriptures, and in all of these scriptures, you're going to see the work of the Holy Spirit in each incident of that scripture that you're reading. That we don't, we just look at, oh, it's the wind. And the wind blew. And the wind did, and the wind brought the locust. What was that word? Ruach. The Spirit brought the locust. And the Spirit called, drive them out. 
This is all the work of God. The Word comes forth, the Word is spoken, and the Spirit moves only on the Word of God. That's all He moves on. He don't move on your Word or my Word or the big preacher's words up there. He'll only move on God's Word. Only on God's Word He'll move. Um, It says, um, by extension... Ruach, the wind, it represents the breath of God or the Spirit of God. Um, it, um, it means um, as the immaterial part of a person because you can't see it. It's the Spirit that lives within you. Um, that can respond to God. So you, your flesh, you can't respond your flesh can't respond to God. It would like to be accepted in all of this. But it's only the Spirit that beareth witness with your spirit that you're the children of God. Okay. When you hear the call, your flesh rejects it. You want to go the other way. But there's something in you that's stirred. That's the Spirit of God saying, Man, you know, I hear the truth and you want to respond. That's not your flesh because your flesh is selfish. Your flesh wants things it's not supposed to have. So it's the impartial part of a person that can respond to God. The seat of life. Wow, that's pretty good, huh? So this is the seat. That's why the Bible says, Grieve not the Spirit until the day, until you say, and and, you know, until the day of judgment. Don't grieve him. Because if you grieve the Spirit, he is the one that seals you unto the day. It's the Spirit that bear witness with your spirit to God that we are the children of God. If the Spirit leaves you, if you grieve the Spirit of God, when it's in fact it says in in a Brit Hadashah in the New Testament, it says, when a house is swept clean and nothing has come in to fill that house. Then the spirit that has been casted out has wandered in dry places, goes and gets seven more, more wicked than itself, to come back to inhabit that temple. That means when, you know, um, when someone uh, uh, receives the Lord, you know, and they receive the spirit, if they grieve the spirit at one time and the spirit of God leaves them, whatever it was they were dabbled in, the spirits that was working in their life, a season later is going to come back and check. Are they still in church? Are they still reading? Are they still doing what they're supposed to be doing? And when the Spirit comes in, look, the computer's like, a, a, you know, up on a computer screen, you know, is a pornography. Obviously not. Well, guess what? The Spirit has rights now. The demonic spirit has rights to go get some more, more wicked than himself. Why? Because it's harder to get rid of those things. You know, it's hard to quit smoking. It's hard to quit drinking. It's hard. Pornography, homosexuality, adultery, idolatry, fornication, lying. You ever try to get somebody that lies all the time to stop lying? It's hard. I know because I've experienced them. It takes work. Oh, wait, that's, just, that's I'm stretching the truth there. You know what I'm saying? So... It's the seat. Um, it is. Uh, it's the seat of life, man. You know, um, the Spirit giveth life. We receive it through Christ Jesus. He comes and seals us until the day. Until what day? Until Jesus Christ comes and gets us and says, you know. Um, He's one of mine. And the Spirit bears witness. Just like the Spirit bore witness with Ruth. And it says, And when Boaz came to the chief servant, the head servant of the reapers. We are reapers in God's field. What are you doing standing here? Why are you not in the field harvesting? And the chief servant bore witness to Boaz as as, as going the testimony of Ruth. She is one of yours. She hasn't been in another field. She has not been in another field. Really? So the Spirit beareth witness, not only to us, but to God, that we're His children. It's the seat of the Spirit, the seat of life. The Spirit. It says... um, um, Being... It says it's the the seat of life. It's the... 
the seat of life spirit being especially um, the spirit gives us life. He gives us life. He's our teacher. He leads us. He guides us. That's the things you guys know um, that we know about the Holy Spirit. Let's see. Um, Here's one. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, we talked about the active work of the Spirit in creation. Um, it says um, in Genesis um, chapter 8, verse 1, um, it was the east wind that, remember when God flooded the earth? It was the east wind that caused the waters to assuage, to go back. Man, he's got something he's doing. The, the, check this out. You're made up of 70% water. Now we see in the wind again in Genesis chapter 8 verse 1. And what is he doing? He's playing a part in waters again. Just like he did, he moved upon the waters in Genesis chapter 1. Now he's moving on the waters in Genesis chapter 8 verse 1 where God told Noah now he caused the east wind to blow and caused the waters to assuage to go back. That is called the Ruach, the breath of God. Just like in Ezekiel, it says, And a strong wind come through the valley in Ezekiel and went over the whole army. That east wind is the Ruach. The breath of God came into them. So the Spirit gave them life. What is the Spirit? The breath of God. It's the same Spirit that God breathed into Adam in chapter 2. And it says that He breathed into him the Ruach. The wind, the breath of God, and he became a living soul. Amen. Same word. Wow. So God in, 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 in you know, setting things up about how do we identify the working of the Holy Spirit or that the Holy Spirit has come. Well, they wasn't speaking in tongues there in the beginning. He, was, he came as the wind. He came as the wind. He came as the wind. In fact, we see the active work of the Holy Spirit in Genesis chapter 11. How do we see the active work of, of, of the Holy Spirit in Genesis chapter 11? Well, we know in the New Testament, in the Berit HaDashah, we see the Holy Spirit has something to do with languages. Right? And they begin to speak with other languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. So He is the one that does something with languages. And in, in Genesis chapter 11 verse 1, God said, Come, let us, let us, come, let us go down and see what man is beginning to do. Right? Let's see this tower and city that they are building. Well, who is us? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So God comes down so that he can see what it is that man has put his mind to. So Jesus is the Word of God made flesh. The Spirit is the active force. Amen. That whatever it is the, the Word of God says, the Spirit of God does. And God said, let us, let us confound their languages. And what did the Spirit do? That's his part. The Spirit went and confounded the languages at the Tower of Babel. A Babel. That's why we see the, the, uh, the dispersion of the languages at the Tower of Babel on the day of Pentecost. Yes. Yes. Come, let us go down. Go down. And the Spirit of God came down. It's the same time. Same thing. Came down. And they receive, you know, as they begin to speak with other languages, in the Tower of Babel, they were dispersed by the Holy Spirit. He confounded their languages. But in the New Testament, on the same day, the active work of the Spirit comes back and says, look, I'm going to bring them back together again under one name, under Jesus Christ. Amen. Same day. Oh, son! That's bad! The work of the Spirit is so amazing. You will under, you'll get an understanding. You won't have a true understanding if you don't understand the Old Covenant. You'll take something and you'll say things like, unless you speak in tongues, you're not saved. My Bologna has a first name. It's O-S-C-A-R. 
My bologna has a second name. <laughs> Baloney! That isn't the interpretation or the understanding. No one scripture is given to any man's one interpretation. It is to be interpreted by the word of God, the word of God only. That is the final authority. Whether you've been taught that, learned that. Listen, I had to tear things out of me that I was taught wrong. Tear them out of me. Brother, there ain't nothing more than like tearing religion out of you. When you thought you've known something your whole life and you find out, my God, it's error. Because if you believe something that does not line up with the Torah, the Psalms, and the prophets, the Old Covenant, if you believe something in the New Covenant that does not line up with the Old Covenant, you are, my friend, in error. That's right. Great error. Yeah. Because it's all about Jesus. So at the Tower of Babel, the Tower of Babel, we see the Spirit confounds the languages so that they can't build anymore. In fact, it's pretty amazing because I, we could probably take denominationalism all the way back to the Tower of Babel. That's right. Because if you don't talk like me, if you don't speak like me, if you don't look like me, yeah. and if you don't have, you know, a certain tight name on your church or whatever it is, well then, you know, you're not a part of us. It's the tower, it's, it's, it's the tower of Babel that separates man. It's the Spirit of God that brings us back together. Yes. And I need to stop. And, um, but next week we're going to get into some stuff that is... Uh, really just begin to carry you into identifying and understanding and maybe just begin to check yourself to see man check you know you know like Paul said to the Bereans I think it's in Acts 15 or 16 the Bereans were more noble than the Thessalonians in that they searched the scriptures daily to see if what Paul was saying was true or not man check me out check out what I'm saying to you don't believe what the pastors and the preachers are telling you up there on the pulpit. You have to stand before God alone. Check the scriptures to see if, if what they're telling you is really true or not. Man, read before and read after. Read the context of what's being said. And man, I'm telling you, it'll open you up. It'll show you things that is like, wow. Because I'm going to tell you, we're not perfect. And I don't have it all together. I'm not perfect by no means. I don't know everything. I'm a man like you. There's only one perfect man, and that man's Jesus Christ. Amen. That's it. There's only one perfect. Don't look at me, you know, and, and you know, think that you know, I'm the best. Because if you're with me long enough, you're going to see my flesh. You're going to see my failures. You're going to see my weaknesses. You're going to see things that, you know, I would have did this and I would have did that. Man, I'm sorry. I'm not perfect. I'm striving to be perfect. 1 Peter 1.16 says, Be holy for I am holy. That right there in the Greek means to practice righteous even as I am righteous. I do practice righteousness. I do. I do get mad. I do get excited. I do, you know, lose it at times. If you don't believe me, ask my wife. <laughs> Put your hand down, baby. <laughs> but you know what? You know, guys, we need, in all honesty... We need the Holy Spirit leading us and guiding us, especially in the times that we're living in. Things are bad. Things are rough. Things are going to get harder, especially for you and me. It's written all over the place. And um, it's written all over the place. And I just want to uh, I just want to encourage you with the scriptures. I want to encourage you to 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 um, you know stay tuned to next week. And um, well, we're really going to just begin to peel this thing open and answer a lot of the questions that uh, about the Spirit, and uh, which is going to be really amazing, because you and me both we need the Spirit working in our life. And um, so we just pray, Father, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Lord, we thank you for we thank you for your Spirit, the gift that you've given us, your Holy Spirit. We thank you that your Son Jesus, the perfect gift has given us the Comforter, Lord. And He is the one that seals us unto this day. Father, I pray, Lord, for those that are here today and those that are listening abroad, 
Lord, that you would fill them with your spirit, Lord, and that you would endue them with power, Father, to preach the gospel. We thank you for it, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen and amen. amen. Love you guys. Amen. 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 Amen.